Hey, this is Mega with Lesson 2 on the Calc Base Physics Series. Today we're talking about instantaneous velocity and instantaneous speed. Uh, hence the key terms instantaneous velocity and instantaneous speed. This over here is the formula that you will learn to use or learn about in this lesson. And when you're talking about instantaneous rates of change, you're going to <clears throat> need some, some knowledge of calculus. Although, for this lesson, since it's mainly conceptual, um, no calculus is needed. And if you do want to learn the required calculus for this lesson, you could check out some other websites, and I'm sure you'll find the information you need. So, anyway, here we go. First off, what is the difference between instantaneous speed and instantaneous velocity? Well, the instantaneous speed is equal to the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity. In lesson one, we talked about the differences between average speed and average velocity. For a minute, let's review those in order to fully understand this new relationship. Average speed we learned was a scalar quantity meaning that it did not imply direction no direction just magnitude whereas average velocity we saw is a vector quantity And we learned that it does specify both a magnitude and a direction. All right. In lesson one, we also learned average speed is concerned with d, or total distance over the time interval, just distance. Whereas average velocity was concerned with displacement. How much has that particle object moved from its initial position in that time interval? So in a sense, if I threw a ball straight up and it came straight down and landed in the same exact spot, my displacement is zero, but my, my distance is some value. So, if this is the case, then how is it that the instantaneous speed is equal to the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity? We saw that they're quite different when we're talking about averages. Well, let's look at a graph. In order to best highlight this difference, let's first consider a few different intervals. First interval being when t is zero and up here which t is some number, doesn't really matter. But basically, if we're going to determine the velocity average of this particle over this time interval, that's going to be equal to our displacement over our change in time. Well here, since our displacement, this is kind of like a ball getting thrown up into the air. Our displacement actually is zero. Because remember, displacement is equal to final position minus initial position. Well, in this case, the final position is zero and the initial position is zero, which means that the displacement is zero. If the displacement is zero, it doesn't matter what the time interval is because zero over anything is always zero. Well, when you're looking at the average speed, when you're considering distance over a time interval, this, this ball did travel a distance. This is going to be a value. And this is what we learned is, is a huge difference between the two. Is it, it's not a good representation of 
how fast that ball was going when you're trying to calculate instant or uh, average velocity over that time interval. Well, let's say the time interval is smaller. So let's say we're trying to determine, say we're trying to determine what happens right here at this point A or something like that. We're trying to figure out what's going on here. Well, if you, which you should, if you know something about calculus, you know that the derivative at this point will be this tangent line right here. Okay. Well, let's look at some stuff here. Let's say that our time interval we move and we say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna create an average between these points, the secant line right here. Boom, secant. All right. Now that's getting closer to what it should look like as our instantaneous velocity. And remember, from that formula, your instantaneous velocity is equal to your limit as your change in t approaches zero of your change in x over your change in t, which is just your your derivative of x with respect to t. Okay. So, we're going to make this time interval approach zero, and we're going to observe what happens as we draw that secant line closer and closer and closer to our main point. Now here's our point we're interested in, and let's say our, our second point, our next position, our final position in a sense, is right here. We still have a secant line, it still draws through, but it is getting closer to this tangent line, or what would be considered the instantaneous velocity at that point. So as this interval, as this time interval approaches zero and collapses in on itself, this is when the distance becomes equal to the displacement. That's why the instantaneous, that's why when you're taking the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity, you achieve the instantaneous speed. In such small intervals, they're the same thing. Now, why, why take the magnitude then? Why not just, if they're the same thing, then they're the same thing, right? All right, so why is it that the instantaneous speed is the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity. This is quite simple. Velocity is a vector quantity and speed is a scalar quantity. This means velocity implies both direction and magnitude. Whereas speed implies, in a sense, only magnitude. Gives you a numerical value. So if you think about it, if you have a velocity of negative 10 meters a second, let's say it's your instantaneous velocity at t equals one, one second or something like that. And you have a negative 10 meters a second velocity. What that's implying is the magnitude is 10 meters a second and the direction is left. Because remember, we're still talking about one dimension. All right. So since speed is a scalar quantity, then instantaneous speed is also a scalar quantity. This means it does not specify direction. So what it comes down to is since there's this difference between what type of quantity they are, in order to achieve the instantaneous speed, you have to take the absolute value of the instantaneous velocity. This is the magnitude. And if you think about it, the magnitude was this anyway, and this was just direction. So. In other words, instantaneous speed is equal to the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity. So basically is equal to the instantaneous velocity 
without the direction component. All right, the derivative, in a, in a sense, makes things instant. It goes from average to instant. What happens is this, if you're just looking at what's in these purple parentheses here, this is technically just an average slope. It's a change in x, or a change in y, over a change in x, because x plus h minus x is h. So this is the nothing more than that change in x, and this is nothing more than a change in y. This is an average slope. By applying this limit and making this h approach 0, that's when you're becoming instant. That's when you're applying the derivative. So basically, if you look over here, you have x and x plus h, f of x plus h and f of x. The slope of those lines at the moment that it stands without applying this limit is this secant line in here. But if you know anything about derivatives, you know that your instantaneous slope is at point x is something more like this. It's a tangent line at the point x. So as you approach, as this h approaches 0, or as this kind of this distance here approaches itself and gets closer and closer to this point, these averages are going to become more and more concise. And eventually you're going to get this tangent line or the instantaneous slope at that point. It's not really any different than the instantaneous velocity. Which, from now on, I will just be calling instantaneous velocity just velocity. If I am specifying for average speed, I will say average speed. If I just say velocity, I mean instantaneous velocity from now on. Well, the change in t approaches zero. Well, from our graphs that we've looked at so far, change in t is down here, and your, your uh, distance up here, or your displacement, in a sense. So if you have t1 and t2, basically this change between those t's would approach itself and this average slope would become more and more accurate until you get that tangent line. And Basically, all you're doing is applying this limit. You're saying you're, you're just making those averages smaller and smaller so you get a better representation at what is happening specifically at that point. All right, so this is the end of lesson two. I'll have lesson three out shortly. Um, if you like these videos, go ahead and subscribe, rate, and Comment, let me know how I'm doing, if I missed anything, said something incorrectly, if you have any ideas for future videos, anything anything to add to what I'm doing. I check my comments regularly, and I will respond to you and accommodate what you're asking for. So I hope to hear from you soon.